Hello, everybody, and welcome to a special exoplanet hangout. And by special, I mean we are. This is something that uh, just sort of we, we planned and decided on doing this yesterday. My name is Tony Darnell, and I'm from DeepAstronomy.com, and we are going to be talking today about some really, I think, amazing developments in the field of exoplanets. Now we have a lot of plans for stuff. Uh, that would be doing in this with this hangout series, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But to get us started here, I thought we're gonna this particular hangout series, and it, I think will be a series, uh, is a collaboration between the Planets Foundation and Deep Astronomy. And I am very excited about what these guys are doing, and I really wanted to sort of get the word out about not only their their various funding initiatives, but also just the kind of science and the work they're going to do. So uh, we'll talk more about our plans as we go on, but let me, uh, let me go ahead and introduce my guests. My guests today are from like I said, from the Planets Foundation, we have Doctor uh, Doctor Jeffrey Kuhn as well as Doctor Svetlana Verdugina with us, and we're going to be talking about some work that they're doing in actually being able to sur uh, image the surface of Earth-sized exoplanets, in particular, and well, in one in particular, like Proxima, Proxima Centauri B. So I'm very excited. I'm actually here to learn stuff, just like you guys are. There's several ways you can interact with us. Uh, you can do it on the YouTube live chat. I'm also live streaming, I hope, on twitch.tv, and you can, I've got the, uh, I've got the, the live chat up here as well, as well as uh, also on facebook.com slash deep astronomy. So I'm hoping I'm up on all of those platforms and uh if not i think kevin's going to tell me so uh without any more further ado let me go ahead and introduce my guests uh here we have uh on the oops, let me turn off that lower third hang on just a sec i've got lots to do here let me turn off that lower third uh on the on on my right i hopefully it's on your right as well is uh dr svetlana bardugana she's uh she's the uh uh she has developed, I, I, I believe you were the one that developed, isn't that true, Svetlana, the uh, algorithm we're going no. to be talking about today? Yeah, we talk, uh, this is, we together, Jeff and I, both uh, developed this. Um, we contributed uh, equally to development, so this is kind of, we cannot even say who, who did what, you know. <laughs> okay, and right to, and on her, uh, and on her, I think right, boy, right and right and left are really messed up for me right now because everybody could be mirrored. Is Dr. Jeff Kuhn? Uh, he is also with the Planets Foundation, and I knew him or I worked with him very many years ago in the my days with solar physics. He's also a solar physicist. So welcome, Jeff. Glad to have you with us. Nice to be. Yeah, oh, good. Okay, so they're actually joining us from a hotel room. So hopefully the uh, the internet connection stays as good as it is right now. Before I get to the details of this um, of this particular algorithm and, and imaging of exoplanets, can you tell us a little bit, guys? And either one of you can go about what the Planets Foundation is trying to do. What they what you who you are now. Oh, I should also mention we did a hangout with these guys uh, before I put the link to that hangout in the description box. So you can also, uh, uh, watch that hangout as well. We did a brief, we did an introduction back then and we talked about life in the universe uh, on that hangout. So please check it out. So can you guys give us a little bit of a, a background on the planets foundation? And then we'll talk more about the science that you guys are working on. Who wants to go? Okay. So uh, we're a bunch of rogue astronomers. We're 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 after we're after uh, direct imaging of exoplanets, and uh, we come from various backgrounds. We're we're part of a group that started a few years ago that that believe that exoplanet studies should have their own dedicated telescope, a telescope that's designed for uh, wavefront control and the ability to see faint things next to bright things. Not the standard uh, garden variety big telescope that's there to look at, uh, uh, say, galaxies, uh, galaxy evolution at, at high redshift. And that's a very different instrument and telescope. So um, Planets is put together over the years with a bunch of very clever engineers, a, a program that, that combines uh, basically three new technologies. Uh, gets us out of the Keck era of telescopes. That's where essentially all of the extremely large telescopes that are in various stages of planning uh, have have uh, have started over the last five years and uh, 
suggests that for exoplanet studies, we should be looking at, at a different way of seeing planets. Now, I've got the... Uh, uh, yes, and... Well, you hang on, Svetlana. I, got, I have the image that Kevin yes, is currently right. showing up uh, as we talk. And this is the kind of telescope you guys are planning on building, right? Yeah, this this is what we see in the image. This is Planets Telescope, uh, which is Planets abbreviation. We made it a uh, clever abbreviation. Uh, polarized light uh, from atmospheres of nearby extraterrestrial systems come together as planets. <laughs> For once, so, an acronym that makes sense. Uh, so <laughs> this polarized light is uh, one of the thing, essential things in our research that we uh, use polarization to increase the contrast of planets with respect to the star. We have tested this uh, with the unresolved systems, Jupiter, hot Jupiters, uh, detected uh, light, polarized light, and now we go forward to uh, apply this technique for uh, Earth-like uh, planets further. And uh, planets uh, telescope, it is off-axis telescope, it helps to decrease the contrast um, uh, or increase increase the contrast of planet to the star by reducing the scattered light from the star. And Jeff was the designer of of this uh, of axis systems, and he can explain better, I guess. You no, know, the, the idea is that is that if we can move everything out from in front of the mirror, that we can have a better a better view of of faint things. So depending on how big and how far away the exoplanet is from, from its star, it can be a hundred billion times fainter or, or maybe a hundred thousand times fainter. And, and in both cases, we need to build telescopes that are optimized to reduce the glare of the, uh, of the nearby star. And this is, this is something which has been in the works for a while. It's been funded mostly by our partners in Japan, but also in Germany. Uh, it's also a really good uh, telescope for looking at, say, the exo-atmospheres of Mercury or of Io or some of the other uh, some of the other planets in our own solar system. So, this when you talk about the seeing very faint things against very bright things, are we talking about getting rid of um, like any kind of occulting system or something like that? Yeah. So, so in the case of of uh, looking at at, uh, for example, an exoplanet next to its next to its uh, bright star, we usually build what we call coronagraphs or occulters to do that. And the coronagraph is the second phase of eliminating scattered light. The first thing you have to do is make sure that the mirror and the optics in front of the mirror don't produce a lot of scattering. Because uh, if you do that before the light gets into your coronagraph, then then you then you, you can't undo you can't undo those problems. So so you're right. Um, the, there's another phase of the the light correction, which is uh, which is a coronagraph that goes downstream from the secondary mirror in this funny looking telescope that you see there. Okay, and so the with the. Um... With the te with with the tele this telescope isn't built yet. It's something that you're trying to get built as part of the Planets Foundation work. And where will this thing be located? Well, you're I know you're both in Hawaii uh, now. Is this where it's going to be built? Will it be built on Mauna Kea? Will it be built on on Maui? Where where or Haleakala? Where are we uh, where where is it? Where are you thinking this might get built? Yeah. Yeah, we just, and this is actually already under construction. Uh, we have elements to be uh, under construction. The mirror is almost finished, polish and process, final polishing, and engineering is uh, going on. We got the permit uh, from from the Department, environment, Department, Department of, of yeah, Resources. so natural natural resources in Hawaii to build this telescope on Haleakala. So we'll re recycle the building, all building there. Uh, so we will pre preserve the outside the uh, uh, building uh, um, and building our telescope inside that with the modification of the roof. So we will make a minimal changes to the building and no changes to the environment. And that was the main requirement for getting this permit. It was a long story, but we successfully completed that. So despite what you may have heard, we are building telescopes in Hawaii, and this is this one on the summit of, of Haleakala is is following all the rules. Yeah, everyone I, yeah. everyone should be happy. And I know well, yeah. there's actually good news now. I mean, with the, yes, there's been some controversy, yeah. especially with the thirty minute yeah. telescope. But I was watching uh, a local news report in Hawaii that was saying that actually there's a lot of public support for exactly the, the you know that. Telescope. 
there was a uh, at the time when permit was under consideration there was a publication in a local website newspaper and the people could vote and you know majority like overwhelming majority was supporting this project so that was good news for us that is very good news okay i've got a comment here from Yurik. he's uh, he's saying that uh uh imaging the surface of an exoplanet seems almost surreal when only a few years ago we were having trouble even finding them that's right i mean that, and that is a good segue Yurik, for what, for what we're going to talk about next i think the the fact that exoplanets <laughs> what is 25 years ago right this wasn't even a science right we so now sure. here we are talking about not just ex, you know how many there are and the fact that there are planets around other stars but now we're talking about the fact that they're you know directly imaging these things and so exactly. this this particular science is seeming to be going at light speed i mean it just seems like advances are being made all the time i want to talk about how we're going to image these surfaces of these and you're talking about earth sized planets here we're not talking about some super uh hot jupiter or anything like that we're talking about planets that are more like uh our earth is that right guys yes and it can be used for any kind of exoplanets we also apply the technique to see jupiter uh structures the stripy cloudy structure so it doesn't matter it's just that the technique works for if we have enough light from the planet but we should be clear there's tricks involved in this like what? Because it's it's not like a, it's not like you hook up your camera onto the telescope and all of a sudden you see the surface of the exoplanet. The there's a limit to the resolution of a camera or a telescope, and the resolution, the direct resolution of of a camera, is is determined by the wavelength and by the size of the opening that that goes into the optical system. It's called the diffraction limit. Right. So and the I diffraction limit. The diffraction limit. For the biggest telescopes you could ever imagine on Earth, optically, um, just barely approach a level where you could actually see detail on the surface of the planet. So, so this involves something else that Svetlana will explain. Well, hang on. Before, yeah, so, we, well, before we do, Jeff, you mentioned two things yeah. I want to clarify about the planet's telescope. You said the wavelength and the aperture of the telescope. So what, right. what wavelengths are you guys looking at and what is the aperture? You didn't say what the aperture of this telescope is going to be. So, yeah, this leads us to the next actually project, telescope project, which was uh, called ELF. Maybe be before we talk about this imaging, we introduced ELF. Okay. I think that's Should we look at what ELF is? Yes. Yeah, so the talk, telescope, that, let's talk about the telescope that will make pictures mm -hmm. of, say, Proxima Centauri B is ELF, which stands for Exo Life, Life Finder. Finder right? <laughs> yes. And, and Exo, Exo Life, Life Finder, Finder ELF. Mm -hmm. Self, exo life finder because yes we don't have yet telescope to see uh, uh, maps or surface structures on the planet we need this telescope we have a technique we will describe later and show our uh, results but we need a bigger telescope which doesn't exist yet yeah and one which, which <clears> knows <throat> how to how to ferret out the faint light from the exoplanet from the glare of the bright well Prox proxima centauri isn't a really bright star but compared to its exoplanet it, it, it's um, about a million times brighter. So now we see this image of Elf. Well, Kevin brought up. Okay, I've got you it can, up now. Uh, uh, Kevin put it up as a bigger picture. Uh, if you share screen, I am. It's up. Um, oh, it's up. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. So this is a. a you see uh, what Jeff calls it bicycle wheel kind of telescope. It's actually a array of uh, planets-like telescopes we discussed before. This doesn't show anything. So it doesn't show up on our screen except as a thumbnail, but but it's well, that, yeah, but trust me, it's up. So go ahead. Okay. Uh, if you okay. want to see it big for yourself, yeah. you can click on it. Just click I'm on the thumbnail, it, and you'll it'll be big yeah. for you. Uh, right. But I've, well, I've already is. got it up. There it is. Isn't that isn't that a, a beautiful thing? Yeah. I, I, I <laughs> so each one of those mirror segments is about five meters across. Now, wait a minute. They're, they're is that a about... truck? Is that a truck right behind there? <laughs> yes, it is a truck. So that's, a, that's some scale. So this thing is pretty darn yes. big. It's, it's done with the wonders of computer graphics. But 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 the wonders of, of telescope optics here are kind of different. So this is a telescope, like I said, that takes us out of the Keck era of large telescopes, where you try to make a single optical surface where the surfaces are and now you can't see my hands, but when the edges of the mirrors are electronically synchronized, then you have a Keck-era telescope. 
So what you try to do is build one single optical primary mirror out of, out of in the case of the TMT, out of many hundreds of individual segments. We have to get away from that because we have to make something which is lightweight and which controls the wavefront much better than this telescope that has all these edges. So why do we have to get away does. from it? I'm yeah. not clear. I'm not clear why we have to get away from it. You said we have to get away from these segments. Well, yeah, because every one of those segment edges. So when you have small segments, you have the ratio of edges to area gets much larger. And when you have those small segments, and, and they're segmented for a reason, because in, in the era of making telescopes, that was a, an appropriate size for that thickness mirror. It was economical. Now, Keck, for those of you who don't know, has a segmented mirror a lot like the James Webb Space Telescope. It's got these hexagonal mirror segments that are yeah. all pieced together right next to each other so to make a larger telescope. It's one way of keeping from making a gigantic piece of glass. Right. And so you're saying exactly. that there, and the disadvantage to that uh, is that there are these artifacts that are mm -hmm. being... Yeah, I just want to also uh, uh, put my five cents here sure, sure. that uh, what Jeff was saying is that ages are important because you have scattering from ages. The more length of ages you have overall, you know, the more scattering you have. So if you have a lot of segments in the telescope, you have a lot of scattering. So what our goal is to reduce number of segments. So now we have in this elf, we have only 16 segments. And so that compared to 600, you know, so the scattered light goes extremely uh, down in this case. And uh, in addition, this, as I said, this is a array of uh, planets telescope we discussed before. So array of off-axis telescope. So each of them has unobstructed aperture to receive the light from a star and send to the individual secondaries. So each primary here on the wheel, what we see, has an individual secondary. And that uh, creates a very low scattered diffraction limited image, which is combined then together to get the diffraction uh, limited image for the 30 meter size telescope. So can I so can I just would... summarize, Svetlana, as okay. I'm looking at this ELF telescope, each one of those round uh, mirrors around the periphery there are pointing to its own secondary at the top of that tower in the middle? You got it. So okay. what what the other the other important keyword in all of this is building optics as uh, scalable systems. So in the TMT, each mirror segment the thirty meter telescope uh, illuminates. Yeah, in the thirty meter telescope or in the extremely large European telescope, the secondary is uh, composed of of elements uh, or or each th it's there isn't a, a yeah it's a solid there yeah. there aren't there aren't separate secondary elements for each primary element. So in a way, what ELF is, is 16 separate independent telescopes. It makes it scalable. As we build this, if we needed to, we could build it with, with starting with three or with five or seven or nine segments. And then as we, as we um, completed the other segments, they could be added into the optical system. Okay. So, well, Jeff, can I just ask then, since all of these are scalable and they're individual, then can... Does is it like when you uh, take a an exposure of a of an image and you say make a hundred second exposure and then you make ten of those and you add them up? That's actually more like a thousand second exposure. Does the light add up? I guess is what I'm asking from each yeah, the, of these individual telescopes. The, the light adds up, but it but it also interferes with 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 the other light, so that so that you can think of this as a we think of it as an interferometer actually. So the and it's called it's called phasing the mirrors. So the the light from from one of the mirrors travels exactly the same distance as the light from another mirror. So they can interfere and behave like a single large op optical structure. So this this uh, this design that you see here is about twenty five meters across, and it behaves when it forms an image like a single twenty five meter. Uh, aperture, even though each one of the individual mirrors geometrically has a slightly different location, they're all being corrected so that the light travels the same distance to the final focus by secondary mirrors that are doing a bunch of active correction in, in what happens. It, it, it's complicated, but the, the basic picture is that 
This is a combination between what astronomers used to call interferometers and telescopes. And, and coronographs also. And, and so a, this is all combination of three. Telescope, interferometer, and coronograph at the same time. Okay, I've got a lot of comments yeah, from people. I want to get to those. But, but before I leave this particular okay. ELF uh, image, uh, what's the diameter of that ring? In, what's well, tw the, uh, this diameter, it, it's 25, it's 25 in, in, in what you're looking at here, about 25 meters. So okay, and this is what you're proposing. 75. Okay. And this is what you're proposing, is that right? Yes. Okay. So this is the telescope, yes. We propose to image directly or indirectly. So there is this uh, a little confusion, what is direct, what is indirect. So we, when we look at the star planet system, what we want, uh, we want large aperture in order to separate star from a planet, a planet from a star, and we want to have enough photons from a, from a planet. So that uh, defines that we need large aperture. But also, we need the high contrast uh, imaging so that the planet is seen above the uh, scattered light from a star. So, and these two important functions are uh, implemented in this design of ELF, basically. These two principles are important. But then once we get photons from that planet, we can analyze this uh, photon uh, flux variations uh, through mathematical techniques, which we can discuss, and get image of a planet indirectly. So that's kind of a combination of direct imaging and indirect uh, imaging analysis. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to, before we leave the topic of the telescope, I'm going to get to some of these comments that Kevin is putting up for me. Uh, he's, uh, let me go to uh, um, uh, Hans Milling. Hey, Hans, it's good to see you back again. Um, he's <laughs> asking about the Kickstarter campaign. Are you getting money through Kickstarter. We They do have one. We are going to talk about that, but I want to talk about science first, and we're going to get to the Kickstarter campaign here in just a minute. Um, uh, Yurik Mazino is asking, how many years will it take to completion? Let's say everything's set. You've got your funding and everything else. How long are you... And I think we're talking about ELF here, which, which if I'm understanding the progression, this is the first stage, right? Yeah. So the Planets Telescope uh, tests some of the ideas that go into thin thin mirrors and, and the algorithms for controlling them. Although the Planets Telescope mirror isn't nearly as thin as the mirrors that we will put into ELF. Um, part of our group is uh, is composed of, of the uh, folks from a company in Vancouver called Dynamic Structures Limited. And it was formed by an engineer who then went on to build the world's largest telescope. So Dynamic Structures built the built the Keck telescope, built the Subaru telescope. They're contracted to build the structure, outer structure, for the 30-meter telescope. They're part of our group, and they helped us estimate the cost and the timeline for being able to finish ELF. And it's surprisingly short. That design of a, of a bicycle wheel is literally a bicycle wheel because it has enormous strength advantages. There's a reason why bicycle wheels don't have a lot of mass and they have spokes and they're under tension. That's that's the same concept that goes into this. Um, so the mass of this telescope is light and that, that's important because that changes, that makes the cost low. And those mirrors, the way that we want to build them would be would be formed with an additive technology, a 3D printing process that makes it possible to make very lightweight, thin mirrors with an electronic structure in between two sandwiches of basically window glass. They'd never get polished. They'd never be abrasively polished. They'd be formed with a slumping process and then shaped more accurately with electronics. A slumping something, process? What, what does that mean? Slumping means that you, you, take, uh, you take a sheet of glass up to near its melting temperature and you use a pressure distribution on the back of the glass, not contact, but uh, gas pressure, uh, to produce the the basic parabolic shape. And then so from the, the cost and the time. Yeah, you know, so the cost and the time are short. Anyway, that that's a long a long winded no, answer to the that. question. Um, it, it's we we could if we had the money in our hand right now. We could we could finish this telescope in five to seven years. Wow, that is not bad at all. Yeah, this is a normal time for building telescope once you have funding. So we are not uh, behind that uh, any other project. And when so. you say when you say the the mirror is almost complete, what are you you're talking about? The proof of concept mirror is that right? The planet's mirror is a is a roughly two meter mirror that's that's just about I, we think it's the thinnest 
conventional astronomical mirror in use in terms of the diameter to thickness ratio. Um, and it uses um, a different version of the technology we want to use with ELF, but it's the first step in proving ELF. And that, that telescope's almost done. That should be finished in about a year. Great. Um, so we're, we have this sort of three-step dance. ELF isn't the final telescope that we want to build, but when we get out of the, the Keck era for telescope mirrors and demonstrate something like ELF, the final step is is something that that's even bigger. But we can talk about that another time. Okay, so the viewers are driving this hangout. We got a ton of stuff. I'm just going to start going here. Um, so, um, Michael Sustrick, how does the uh, how does the telescope block the planet sunlight? You said earlier that we were talking about getting getting very dim things next to very bright things. Do you want me to answer that? Yeah, sure. So, so we're now building telescopes where the wave front, where the wave properties of light are being controlled at the level of the telescope. So because remember we said that the light actually is interfered back in the final image, we can change by min minute amounts the, the positioning of the, the light from every one of those mirror segments. And we can make that light interfere so that so that the central light is dark so that we cancel the light from the star it's called a it's called dark spot uh coronography or nulling interferometry um it's a technique that's been around for a while in the laboratory and we're putting it into the structure of the telescope so the telescope itself becomes what you would call the coronagraph and by changing the delay between how light arrives at the final image from each one of those um, mirror segments, we can cancel out the light <laughs> and make a dark spot where we can see the planet. That is unbelievable. So you can really get that kind of control over the interference levels of this that that and, and block out the star. Yeah, Kevin, did did we make a picture of the 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 um, points per function? No, we don't have that. We didn't make that. Okay. No, we didn't have that. Well, uh, on another show, we'll we'll show you some. Next um, time we're showing models, you this. Models yeah. that show how that works. All right, good. All right, good. Uh, boy, you guys are really going with these questions. This is like more than we get on Thursdays, too. Uh, so, um, uh, Sammy Cheese 99. <laughs> really? Okay, well. Um, okay, so let's see. Sammy Cheese 99. Is this why the overwhelmingly large telescope was canceled? Each mirror segment was only a couple meters across, I think. Yeah, it's, uh, it was too expensive. That's why it was canceled. And if you scale up the Keck technology, it becomes really expensive. Look, TNT and ELT, current version 30 and 39 meters, they are over $1 billion. And all overwhelming large telescope of 100 meters in time, it was like multi-billion project. About 12 billion. Uh, yeah, 12 billion. So it's equivalent to James Webb telescope kind of in space. You wow. know, it's super expensive. Yeah. And yeah, no one can pay this money. And and plus, it's hard to imagine how all this uh, uh, construction can actually function and uh, how many segments there are. I'm not sure anymore. It's like sub many thousands of segments. If a 30-meter telescope has a 39, has thousands, you know, no, this is many thousands. So that is uh, definitely uh, was uh, no goal. And uh, going beyond 30 meters, that's what we do. We we do 25, and then next, as, because our technology is scalable, we go to 70 and 60, and nothing can stop us because this is all scalable. I like that. Nothing can stop us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Only, of course. I mean, we are scientists. Get us. out of our way. All yeah. right. So. Um, so the, Higher. And and the price is below below the billion. So I mean the real um, uh, yeah a billion or less basically. I mean we don't have a precise number, but something between half a billion and billion. You're talking about colossus. Yes, colossus. Yeah, yeah, no, Elf is Elf, Elf is colossus. between fifty and hundred millions. Okay, so. I can see. Yeah, this is why we're doing a series of these hangouts. Okay, uh, I want to get off the telescope, guys, because we promised to talk about direct imaging in our hangout title, yes. and I want to get to that now, uh, to the science of what the Planets Foundation is doing now. Svetlana, please correct me if I have this wrong, but I believe you have a paper in the works now that describe a way to directly image Earth-sized yeah. exoplanets 
like Proxima Centauri B. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Exactly. And maybe let us know, maybe give us a what journal and maybe when if it's coming out, a uh, rough, rough timeline. Yeah, Jeff and I are working on this. It's a final polishing, let's say. <laughs> so we have all the results. We present this on the conference talks now and also here at Astrobiology Conference and last week on Breakthrough Foundation Conference. And so that is a uh, result of final, just the paper we have to polish a little bit uh, text-wise. Uh, so, yeah. The, um, let's look at an image. Yeah, let's look at the image. Maybe not exactly this one, Kevin, but the, the Earth, because the Earth, for the Earth, um, uh, kind of geography, yeah, Earth geography, yes. Um, we we actually used real data from NASA uh, uh, database on uh, Earth observations. This is up top map is a kind of inclined uh, um, stretch map of the planet, as we could see it from the North Pole. Um, it's a low resolution map, but you can see there is Africa, North and South America, and Australia, and and this uh, Europa and Asia all there, uh, recogni recognizable. Yeah. So so yeah so like Svetlana said this is our this is our exoplanet we took a model of the earth and we put it far away and then we used the technique to see what we would see with this what's what's called this these tricks we mentioned and we recovered the image that's down below and and and, and like she said uh, was this all done with a simulation Jeff Yes this was a simulation so so yeah, so the top map is uh, input for our uh, algorithm, and the bottom map at the bottom is the output. So that is called inversion. So what we do is that we simulate a light reflected from the a planet as we see it far away from Earth, and uh, as the planet goes around the star, it reflects uh, the light. And then we simulate that light uh, uh, plus this planet rotates. So this combination of orbital motion and rotational motion gives the variable signal in the flux. And then what we do in mathematically is called inversions. We basically infer the map uh, of the planet, which can produce such signal. Uh, as okay, we I, 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 now, This is where I'm still learning, guys. So give me... Right. Be patient with me here. You you guys said that you started with a model of the Earth. You moved it really far away in simulations. You ran right. your algorithm and came out with the lower map there. When now, yes. Do I have that right, the basic idea? Yes. Okay. So that included the sun, the light from the sun on the Earth far away. Is that right? Uh, no, no, no. So this is like, uh, of course, the planet is around other star. So we assume, just for for just for the case of simplicity, let's say that we we know how Earth look like. Yeah, we know this continent's outline. So how well we can uh, see these oceans and in the continents if we look at Earth from a very far distance. So now imagine Earth goes around the sun. It takes 365, six days. Uh, and then we, through the year, we observe uh, this uh, light reflected by this uh, Earth, the sunlight reflected by the Earth. But we just see it from really far away. And I then see. we so analyze the assuming... uh, variations of that light. Okay, so you're already assuming then that the, that the light from the sun has been blocked out already, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. It's, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there, start, yeah. is there a way that you could describe what you're doing in a way that we might understand? I mean, is there a, I mean, the, the, maybe, I don't know, some algorithmic right. steps that you're taking. I, I, I know that's probably a lot of math, but we don't have to go yeah. through that, but I would like to try and understand the algorithm itself. Yeah. So the algorithm is um, uh, basically uh, uh, we don't have those images, but uh, um, so when when the planet rotates, we see on this top map that yellow is means that it's actually brighter albedo, and you see Greenland is very bright, uh, covered by snow. So when the planets rotate, we see brighter and not so bright area of the planets see illuminated by the stellar light. So we see light goes up and down uh, as we observe this motion of a planet. And that's what we call light curve 
or phase curve sometimes in exoplanets it's called. So that uh, light curve uh, variations uh, contain this uh, co convolved image of the of the planet. So each da data point has a uh, kind of combination of uh, pixels on a planet map. And then our technique is to basically uh, decipher from the series, this time series of measurements uh, to deconvolve image that we kind of substitute uh, we, we, from one, one dimensional time series, we get two dimensional image that we actually uh, uh, through this process of deconvolution I don't know how to explain so Tony, it. Here's another way of thinking of it. Pic picture a planet that's all ocean and it just has one great big island near the equator. Okay. So it turns out oceans are dark. They don't reflect very much energy except when they glint. So now you got, you're a long way off. You've got a telescope that just adds up all the light that comes off of the earth that's reflected from the star nearby. Okay, so imagine Imagine that, that that planet is rotating like it is, and you're looking at its towards its equator. You can't distinguish the North Pole from the equator. You just add up all the light. Now, when that planet, when that when that when that island is on the planet from where you're looking, you just see ocean and it's dark. And as it rotates across the edge of the planet into your field of view, the side of the planet that you see it starts to reflect more light and so it, so it gets brighter. You get a spike. So that spike will be indicative of a brighter feature on the surface. And at the time when it appears, actually uh, related to the place where it is on the planet. So, so you're, you're, using the, you're using the fact that the planet is rotating and the amount of light that we get from the whole planet is modulated by when things come over the edge of the planet and face towards us. So when the, when the big island in the middle of the ocean faces towards us, more light gets reflected towards us, the observer, and, it, and, and we see uh, a, a change in the brightness. Somehow the planet gets brighter and, and, it, and it changes its brightness, synchronous with the rotation of the planet. But you're also, okay, so you're assuming two things. Is, is I, well, maybe not assuming, but you're counting on two things. One, that there's differences in brightness as the planet rotates. The, the different features will reflect differently. And you're also resolving the planet, right? The planet is an actual disk now. It's not just a point that you're looking at, no, right? No, it's just a point. The planet is just a point. It's just it's a, a point. But every measurement, like every flux measurement, has contribution from all pixels on a planet and then you rotate it it will be another measurement and different pixels contributing and then another measure, different pixel contributing so when you analyze this con which pixels contribute to one measurement and it's changing this contribution changing you can actually recover the distribution of these pixels on oh, a planet okay so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try and re-say this and tell me okay. if i get it wrong you have a point a uh, source of light which is the planet that you're looking at variations right. in brightness of as it rotates and from that difference that stream of differences in brightness are due to different features on that planet causing it to get brighter or dimmer depending on what the feature is you're able to take those differences of that brightness and just based on that build a map like the one on the bottom panel that Kevin is showing right. Yes. Isn't that amazing? Yes, and, exactly. and that, that's what that test was with the Earth. So it's as if, right, if you look at Venus, our eyes can't distinguish the, the, the shape of Venus, the crescent shape. We need, we need a telescope. But you may know that if you're a sky watcher and you look at Venus, Venus changes its brightness during the course of its orbit. And if we had a very careful measurement of, of that, we could, we could, in fact, look at surface structure on Venus, except it doesn't have any. It's just a, just a, clouds, yeah. just clouds all over and just reflect. Oh, okay, well, that begs the question. Okay, you did this on a planet with heavy cloud cover. How do you know that those differences in brightness aren't just due to some kind of cloud cover? Yes, we also tested it on clouds. So we took the same data from NASA webpage on clouds, and we put clouds on top of it. And, of course, I mean case of Venus is extreme. If planet covered by clouds, you see clouds. So, and we do hope that there is intermediate case, like Earth is intermediate. There are some patches without clouds and some are covered by clouds and it's variable. Again, if we observe long enough, we can extract the non-variable part of the planet uh, continent structure uh, 
uh, underneath this variable part of clouds. So this, uh, if clouds contribute to, to, and it will contribute to the light reflected by the planet, then it will be variable, like stochastically or randomly variable. And we can separate this constant uh, non-variable signal or almost non-variable from variable. Oh, wow. Okay, so let me get... There was yeah, a, we need more data, of course. Uh, there was a related question to this then I want to get to. Oh, here it is, from Adam Synergy. Uh, he's asking, uh, does this technique account for things like stellar limb darkening and star spots? So I'm going to say... Because it, I don't think it does. It does have nothing to do with the star. It has more to do with the planet. Case, what yes. about limb darkening of the planet? Does that oh, matter? Yeah, at all? this is all. Yes, limb darkening of the planet, of course, included because that de defined by the atmosphere. Yes, we include atmosphere. We include clouds and but, reflectance but, from the. But surface. maybe his question is if the, if the star changes its brightness. So if the star changes its brightness fine, because yeah. of because of a big spot that rotates, and so. So the amount of light that illuminates the planet will will change. We'll see that, and and that would be an effect. But, but, but in general, those sorts of stellar brightness changes, unless they're flares or it's an active star, are small. Um, they're at a few millions or, or or thousands of the brightness, and the brightness variations that we're looking at are much much larger than yeah. They are the many percent variations. Yes. Yeah. Wow. This is this so is. This, this fluctuations will be small because we resolve you see that question probably comes well, from the background some stars, some stars that are flare stars yeah. will have, will have, will have but at the same stars. time we'll have the stellar flux as well in parallel i we also yeah. write this in paper that sure there will be some uh stellar variations and we'll have to monitor the star in order to account we for could that. divide that up but yes. i think he's saying that if the side facing the, the planet yeah. we might not have monitored yeah well Okay. Yeah. So that, I, I guess that's true. There, I actually wasn't thinking that, but you, good point, Jeff. There are variations in the star as well as in yes. things like clouds and darkening in the limbs of the of the uh, on the on the planet itself. I, I, the, the, but I think Svetlana, correct me again if I'm saying anything incorrectly. But the the model that you're running is a, is you need to know the size of the planet itself you're assuming it's a sphere and then your model takes all of those corrections into account correct yes now, yes uh, you know i'm also a stellar astronomer and i did star spot studies for many years so i do know how to treat stars <laughs> are you worried at all that some of these some of these planets that we're talking about these earth-like planets are around red dwarf stars and they're supposedly highly variable right and especially early in their yeah, life yeah. does that worry you at all no, I, I love them dwarfs, red dwarfs. I love them. Let them be variable. I want to study their magnetic activities too. So we, we actually do both here. We can do both. We can study planets and we can study stars at the same time. This is exciting. Oh, it but, is. But Tony, the, Tony, the point I think here is that there's, we see the stars, the starlight separately. And so we can see the starlight going up and down and correct yeah. The brightness that we see coming off of course, the planet oh, yeah. by that starlight. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we can study both at the same time, stars and planets. Okay. Uh, is there any plan? Um, you, you've worked this out on a model of the Earth. Uh, is there any plan to follow up with some actual observations? Can any telescopes that currently exist give you observations that you well, can Well, maybe I'll go next to Proxima B case. You All know? right, let's do that. Uh, we can that's show fine. what we can do best for Proxima B. Okay. That's the next image. Uh, it's a little... It's 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 again like Proxima B. Um, yeah, let's let's uh, let's see this one. Uh, oh, the other one. Which one? Let me look at the other one. Oh, the other one, Kevin. Uh, it's the other one which files called Prox B. Uh, Got it. Something. So that uh, again the same uh, kind of input. So that for Prox B, we don't know what's the what is on the surface. Let's hope it's the same as Earth, like second Earth. So we use the same input image. And we could uh, we put all geometrical orbital and parameters of Prox B. So it's eleven days uh, orbital period, uh, which is probably uh, most probably synchronized. This is the case of tidally locked planets. So when planet is tidally locked, as you can imagine, and then uh, only half of the planet is illuminated uh, because it's synchronized like Moon with Earth. And then uh, the quality of the map reduces, and we can only see continent parts which are reasonably recovered uh, on this map uh, below the input map, uh, only which are centered on that hemisphere. 
you know, that in this case, this Africa, Americas and Europa were centered around the center meridian uh, in, this, in the middle of this map, uh, which was illuminated by the star. While the you see the uh, quality for Australia and South America is reduced because those parts were not so well illuminated. Wow. So you did the same thing, assuming that Earth was tightly locked around a star similar to Proxima B then? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So there's the same. I mean, so when we have ELF uh, built uh, in Chile in five years with the help of our uh, donors and sponsors, then we can apply this technique to this light curves and uh, to get the map like this. And I, of course, we'll not see Africa there, but we'll see something different. And that's exciting. All right. And that's what next image, uh, what Kevin uh, put before. So that next image, like hypothetical planet. Uh, hopefully that's something that we can see on Proxima B life and uh, oceans and deserts uh, you see this so top map is composite of patches of earth-like uh, kind of images now this image is taken in three bands this is our smartphone cameras and digital cameras work in this rgb uh, bands so we we assume that we make measurements in three bands this uh, red blue and green and then we recover these images separately for each band and then combine again them into true uh, color image, which is shown at the bottom. So top input, bottom output. So you can see that we can distinguish between uh, a vegetated area, deserted area, ocean, of course. And, and that, would be a, that would be possible with ELF. Well, and you see the ice caps. We can yes. find the ice caps. And, and, yes. and the, what is desert is the brown areas. What is forested and more more vegetated is is the green areas in these maps, and we recover that pretty well. And, and this so, is uh, very uh, uh, reasonable. I, this is a absolutely possible thing to do. So Alexander Reinders is commenting: Could you also detect signs of chlorophyll on such a surface? And I think that answers that question, right? I mean, you yes. can sort of see these different kinds of uh, textures on the on the surface of the planet. Yes, and what is exciting when we talk about finding life on other planets, we are not anymore limited by uh, to the uh, integrated light over entire planet and figure out how much percent of our organisms contributing to biosignature. We can actually look at individual patches here on this map and uh, see that also will be in our paper that we can see the signal of red age from photosynthetic organisms what we have on Earth without uh, degradation, without significant degradation of a signal. Wow. And so I, if I'm not mistaken, guys, you guys are at a conference right now where you're talking about all of this, right? This is this paper, yes. effect, right? So when's the paper due out, Svetlana? Yes. Well, uh, the plan was to actually finish it uh, during the conference. <laughs> so, But we're so overloaded with everything. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, yeah. I want Tomorrow to... I give this talk and Jeff also. So we, we finish our... We have a special session tomorrow dedicated to this discussion of telescopes and this technique and... So we'll have to finish after that, definitely. Great. Okay. Well, we'll, well like I said, we'll be, be able to talk more about this in future Hangouts. So Yurik uh, is asking, what level of detail can we expect? I think those images we just showed, those maps that we just showed, uh, give you a good idea of what you might be able to uh, get out of this. And he's also asking, can this single telescope image the exoplanet? And if so, uh, can it be used for black hole accretion disks? It sounds to me like based on what I've known, what I understand is that you're looking at variations in brightness of a single point. So not necessarily be able to see things like accretion disks and, and whatnot, right? Well, so this is this is the way we build bigger and bigger telescopes, bigger than than in, in this, as I call it, the Keck era of mirrors. And um, this inversion relies on the fact that the planet is reflecting light from a central source. If you tried if you tried to look at just the thermally emitted light from a planet, not reflected, then you couldn't do the same thing. You could only get uh, we had longitudinal information. You couldn't actually make a map. So we're relying on the fact that it's reflected light. Now, in principle, um, the unresolved region near the ergosphere or near the near the accretion uh, zone of a of a black hole could be imaged, but it'd be a lot more complicated because the radiation source comes from and the scattering is is not. There's not a central source in that case. Got it. Yeah, that's an interesting idea, uh, though. But 
Well, don't Andrew, don't underestimate the cleverness of astronomy. I do not do yes, that. I we never, will figure it out. <laughs> I never I never do that. I learned that after K two and kept what they did with Kepler. So uh, yes. I do not yes. underestimate uh, what they can do. And Planet's got a good question. He goes, "Would this new technique uh, that allows astronomers to directly image the surfaces of Earth sized exoplanets also be implemented in a space telescope?" Now, as I understand it, you guys rely on a time series. Excuse me, a time series of data. So you'd need a lot of it, right, over over time. Yes, uh, sure. If uh, elf-like telescope can go to space, that would be incredible. So, uh, it as we, oh, you dropped out a little bit. I have to separate star and planet uh, first step, and then have it at a low, uh, at a low scattered light from a star. So scope so that is the second requirement and if elf goes to space we're both hands up <laughs> <laughs> you are but 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 these are problems right these are problems that depend on the diameter of the telescope and what you gain in space uh to control the wave front from the atmosphere easier to do but you know we're doing that now on the ground with adaptive optics the other thing you gain is the ability to sense wavelengths that aren't transmitted by the atmosphere. So there there are advantages, but these problems that we're talking about, the exoplanet problems, mostly on the diameter of the telescope. And, you know, to build something on the ground and to put it into space it is at least a factor of 100 in cost. Oh, it's probably 1,000. Guess, yeah. guess which is more expensive yeah. in yeah. space. Right. Um, so so the, the advantage you get in terms of wavelength coverage and, and easier wave rent wavefront control isn't really borne out by what what we can do from the ground when you when it is the big telescope that we need okay so boy the time is, is smoking by and i still want but i'm going to go to kieran kumar who's asking the segue question i want to move on we've we've talked about the algorithm a little bit now i want to go on to the kickstarter campaign are there any opportunities he is asking to be a part of the project and i'm going to use this as a segue uh into some of the way in, uh, to talk about your kickstarter project and some of the things like the exocube and whatnot so let's yes. talk about that now and uh i want to let you guys know that i put a link in the description box if you go to uh exocube uh, dot com, I think uh, it'll take you to the Kickstarter campaign, but you can also no, not go... exactly exoplanet cube, exoplanet cube. For, uh, forgive me, forgive Sorry. me, Exo... exoplanet cube dot com. Right, and it'll take you to the kick. I put that link in the description box of all the streams, so you should be able to click on that. Uh, who wants to tell us a little bit about this program and what the Exo Cube is? I actually have one. It was sent to me by. Um, let me let me put it on my better yeah. camera because uh, this will cut off the the, vi the video of the uh, of the, the audio of the hangout for a moment but I wanted to show you this this is one of the things that they're offering it comes in a really great uh, case it looks like this and I'm hoping I can get there we go and um, what's in here I'm just going to talk about it real quick guys and I'm gonna let you go on into it more but and um, the this is a laser etched map of all of the exo exoplanets and on top is i think in this case it says i have the proxima b1 let me just put it up here the proxima b1 and that's up here and so i'm gonna put the audio back on those guys so they can talk more about this uh yeah go ahead yeah so we are yes we designed this comp uh, campaign on uh, kickstarter to support uh, construction finishing construction of of the planet telescope we talked in the beginning and also to start working on elf telescope of course depending how much we money we collect and that execute was uh, designed by us actually by three of us you know <laughs> to uh, give this sense of uh, attachment to the to the project. Get, give the uh, sense of gratitude that you contribute to this project and and have this be beautiful piece as a science gift. And we have here the uh, to show maybe the other version of it with the uh, another sphere for Trappist one, uh, uh, Trappist one F here, <laughs> and uh, it, it's reverted a bit. So so we have a tourmaline. Uh, a mineral on top so, and these are all spheres and real minerals and um, each planet has its own mineral and you know most of these minerals is silicon dioxide which is sand or quartz 
And this is exactly what rocky planets are made of. Uh, Earth is like this and other rocky planets in the solar system. We expect other rocky planets in the universe uh, very similar to this. So this is a very good uh, representative. It's beautiful. And sure, if you want to become uh, our supporter, please uh, help us to collect money on Kickstarter. But if you want to contribute also in kind, and we uh, do invite people with their engineering or uh, software uh, skills uh, to our group or uh, technical skills, management skills, social skills, we, we want everybody to join us to promote this project, to put it forward and yes in five years build the elf telescope and look at uh, continents and prox b and other nearby exoplanets yeah so this is uh this is your chance to get involved folks i feel pretty strongly about this uh about this about this project i'm glad to lend my support to it in whatever humble way i can i really think that the work that they're doing is uh, amazing and i want to help get the word out about this and so uh as you can see the exocube there that kevin has up is just stunning it's got uh, you can see all you can see a map in there of there's the trappist system there's uh, gliese 176b uh you got all the different exoplanets well what this is this map is it just a region of the sky svetlana is that yeah, this is exactly, this is a 3D space as planets distributed around us within 50 light years. So we limited 50 light years because that's kind of reasonable, reasonable distance from which we can get light uh, with our telescopes uh, from ex, uh, exo-Earth uh, uh, like planets. How much do they cost? And that's what Galaxy is asking. Most likely habitable. How much to get one? How much to get one? 140 if you early bird, but there are only 10, I think, left of those, and 150 uh, after that. So be be fast to get those 10 for 140. They're amazing, guys. And they that... really are, and it's a way to get involved in getting some uh, funding for these guys to uh, to do the work. And yeah, we, yeah, we have version also without the sphere, so just a cube like this. It's 110. <clears throat> uh, so, and this is... Uh, you know, we uh, we also spend money on making them, and uh, so this is a very humble price actually for for the effort we do. It's and, gorgeous, um, it really is. Yeah, yeah right. we would be very happy to support us. Thank you. Okay, so uh, that brings us to toward the end of the hangout. But I want to remind you guys that okay, so. <laughs> This is something that basically we've just set up today, and uh, because I want to talk about exoplanets more uh, in, on my channel, as well as all of the different, as well as the search for life in the universe, uh, we've all agreed in, co in collaboration with the Planets Foundation and with Deep Astronomy that we're going to have these exoplanet hangouts every Wednesday. And this one is uh, in the middle of the afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. But next week, we're going to be doing these at 7 p.m. Uh, uh, Eastern Time. I know that's late for you guys in Europe, and I'm sorry, but these guys are in Hawaii. And right now, it is very early in the morning for them. So what is it, 10 o'clock, 1030 over there? So... Oh, yeah. uh, so yeah, we and, and so this puts it at one o'clock their time, seven o'clock my time. I know it's after midnight in the uh, in in Europe, and it's about midnight in the UK. But it is uh, it is something you can watch after the fact, of course. And I'll read your qu questions and comments uh, all throughout, even when we're doing the ones uh, after um, after the uh, after the hangout is over so i hope you'll watch this will be a regular event every wednesday it doesn't replace any of my other hangouts this is an addition to my other hangouts and i don't know i'm going to talk with kevin after this is over but we might change it to a podcast or we're going to we're going to play with the title i'm not quite sure what we're going to end up calling it, but right now it's exoplanet hangouts uh 7 p.m eastern time on this channel i'll also be uh broadcasting on twitch and facebook Although I might switch to Periscope at some point on one of those. I don't know which one because I want to see which which platform ends up being the better one. So uh, so look for this look for this next next week, guys. What do you want to what do you want to talk about, or do you want to wait until before we uh, go into any kind of topics yet? Because there's a lot. We can there talk about the exoplanets which are inside the cube. So we can talk about Proxima B, Trappist system, and other. Uh, uh, Earth-like planets, so we can talk about them, and we'll try to bring a guest who is uh, also specialist in exoplanet research. 
Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Okay, good. So here we go, guys. Uh, the Planets Foundation, please visit their Kickstarter campaign. Help them out if you are so inclined. Uh, all of this is going towards helping promote the telescopes that we've seen talked about here. We're going to go into way more depth about this. But these guys uh, have a lot to talk about with respect to exoplanets and life in the universe. And so we're going to cover all of that. All right, guys. Well, on behalf of my guest, Kept, Dr. Uh, Svetlana Bergdrugan, Ber- Ber- Berdugana and uh, Dr. Jeffrey Kuhn. I want to thank you all very and and for Kevin Lewis who was providing a lot of support on the uh, chat as well as the links uh, 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 and the and the images. Uh, I want to thank you all very much for watching and as always keep looking up. <laughs>